for our Money Talks presentation. Uh, we're very excited for this opportunity to come together at a time when we're all so far apart. Uh, I'd like to give a special thank you to our presenter that has put in many hours to make this happen in such a short time. As you may have seen, we've added many new e-learning website, uh, new opportunities to the ANA website. Uh, if you have not checked out money.org in the last month or so, I recommend jumping on to see the other new presentations we've added as well as our upcoming schedule. So during this presentation, you may come up with questions. If you do, please use the chat or Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to send in your question as all of our attendees are muted during this presentation. Your question will come to me and I will share the questions with the presenter at the end. If at the end of the presentation, we are unable to get to all the questions, I will send them to the presenter to answer. Toward the end of the presentation, I will be sending out a survey using the poll feature here in Zoom. Please answer each question honestly so that we can improve our presentations. The surveys will be shared anonymously with the presenter so that they too uh, can improve if needed. Now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for the day, Raymond Williams. Ray will be giving a money talk titled an introduction to collecting colonial paper money, tis death to counterfeit. This presentation will discuss the need for paper money in colonial America, their issue by the colonies and the Continental Congress, and contemporary counterfeiting. Reference books and methods of collecting will be presented. Examples from several colonies and the Continental Congress will be shown and discussed. Now our presenter, Ray Williams, collects colonial coins, paper money, and medals. A recently retired electronic technician, Ray started collecting coins at age 11, earning the Boy Scout uh, Merit Badge, or the CCMB. He is a columnist for the numismatist and an ANA regional representative for New Jersey. He is a fellow of the ANS in New York and active in local, regional, and national organizations. He is past president of C4, or the Colonial Coin Collectors Club, and very active in EAC, or Early American Coppers. Ray enjoys sharing his hobby, fun, in print, and presentations. So without further delay, Ray, when you're ready, take it away. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Sam. Okay, well, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, one of the ways I enjoy this hobby is by sharing it with other people. And uh, this is... But this is just so strange for me. I'm talking to a computer. It's kind of like uh, Rod Serling, the Twilight Zone. Uh, you have no control over the horizontal or the vertical. But uh, uh, this presentation is not your normal PowerPoint. Uh, I want to make it like you're sitting with me in my living room. And uh, I'm just showing you some bills, telling you some stories. Uh, the questions will be answered at the end. Uh, I'm uh, going to share uh, screen here first. And uh, this is the title screen that uh, the ANA gave me. And at the bottom there is an email address, rwilliamsatmoney.org. Uh, should you not get your questions in or answered, uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, you'll see that I was wearing my red uh, ANA regional representative shirt. If you have any questions about the ANA, uh, you don't have to be from my region in New Jersey. You can email me anytime. Uh, questions about anything colonial, uh, numismatic is always welcome. And it's a pretty easy email address to memorize. Uh, okay, I'm going to start a little bit uh, in, uh, out of order how I normally go. But I'm going to talk about a couple publications that uh, uh, you can use for colonial paper money. And, and my screen is not advancing. Let me stop share and go to a different screen. Um, okay, slideshow from beginning and see if this, there we go. Uh, paper money, uh, the Paper Money in the United States by the, the Freedbergs 
is the reference book that the Slavin services use. Uh, this book has, I don't know, about 30 or 35 pages uh, dedicated to continental currency and colonial paper money. And they have a numbering scheme uh, whereby there's a two uh, letter designation for the state or continental currency, and then a number afterwards. And it makes it easy to document or create an inventory of your paper money. But this is what the grading services use uh, uh, on their slabs. The most useful book is the early paper Money of America uh, by Eric Newman. This is uh, the fifth edition and the, the last paper edition uh, came out in 2008, I believe. And Eric is no longer with us, but uh, his book is living on. Uh, it's available on the secondary market. It's been out of print for a while. And I like to hold a book in my hand and be able to put notes in the margins. And this is well worth the expense uh, to add to your library. Whether you collect this money or not, there's a lot of history and information in here uh, about numismatics of the time period. This is a chart, uh, which I'll refer to this later on. Uh, this is continental currency. And I'm going to make this available. Anybody who wants a copy of this in an Excel spreadsheet uh, can email me uh, at any time, ask for it, and I'll email it to you. Uh, the continental currency, you have all the issue dates uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, all the denominations across the top, in each square uh, is the number issued in thousands. Uh, the green squares uh, are uh, issues that were counterfeited by the British and others. And on the far right uh, is the amount that was designated uh, to be printed to give you a, a rough idea how much was out there during colonial times. Also, this gives you a, a rough idea, excuse me, of uh, rarity. But uh, I'll refer to this when we get to continental currency, but this is available to all. And then I'll put this up at the end so that you can copy my email address down if you don't have it. Uh, with respect to the books, okay, the Newman Norm Numismatic Portal has a lot of books on it. Uh, including early paper money of America. And you can go there, and this is the book in the Newman Numismatic Portal. So if you want to see what it's like before you spend the money uh, to get it, uh, you can go to the portal, and it's a, a great resource for all types of information. The internet, while it's working, has been a boom. Uh, to our hobby. But not only do they have this early paper money of America, they also have a living, breathing early paper money of America. This is constantly being updated by the portal uh, with new information, uh, minor corrections, new uh, uh, images of notes. Uh, take, for instance, the uh, New Jersey. Uh, let's take February 1776. In the paper book, there's only a picture of one bill from that issue. And here on the portal, you have uh, a, a lot of bills. Okay, somehow I got uh, bounced out of there, but that's pretty much it with respect to uh, having uh, information. There are classic books. Henry Phillips wrote. Uh, uh, a classic reference in the mid 1800s. Uh, so did uh, John Hickox. Uh, uh, Harley Freeman's notes are extremely valuable on the portal. But I don't want to talk all day uh, about books. I, we're here to talk about colonial paper money. I got interested in collecting these when I saw at a friend's house a framed uh, set of bills from the 13 colonies. And I looked at it and it was just a wonderful thing to behold. And I figured, I calculated out that it would take me a, a few years, but it was something doable that I could obtain on a budget. And I went on from there and I eventually completed that set. The last bill I needed to get was a 
built from the colony of Georgia. Uh, Georgia and New Hampshire, the most expensive ones. Fortunately, Vermont was not a colony or not a state until 1791. So I don't include those in the 13 colonies and anything from Vermont is extremely rare and extremely expensive. The very first uh, bills that were produced in this country, I need to share screen again. And here we go. Okay, in uh, 1690, uh, Massachusetts had uh, issued bills and they were to, uh, they didn't have the funds to pay troops for a military expedition. And they were the very first colony to issue bills. This right here is a reproduction. It's, uh, I can't afford the original. Uh, it, it's just extremely rare and uh, only museums, maybe one or two collectors have an example of this. All the paper money uh, for the colonies uh, was denominated in pounds, shillings, and pence with few exceptions. One exception is New York in 1709, where it's denominated in lion dollars. And this is, uh, they give how much weight it's worth in silver or lion dollars. And uh, this is fascinating. A friend owns this bill and uh, there are a few out there and I would love to have one of these someday, but I, I fear it's not in my budget, but I can appreciate what my friends have. And, and I go over and, and I, I always enjoy looking at these older bills. Other than that, uh, until 1767, anyway, everything is in pounds, shillings, and pence. Uh, the first bills issued in dollars were from Massachusetts. I, I'm sorry, excuse me, Maryland in 1767. And these, uh, to try to get these nice, it, it's very difficult. This is one of the nicer ones I was able to obtain on a budget. And let me get that uh, zoom out of there for you so you can see it. And you have the Maryland State Seal, uh, the dollars, of course, the dollars at the time were Spanish mill dollars, as we didn't have a mint and uh, no federal dollars uh, were being made at the time. There's one other, uh, exception to the rule uh, with respect to the denominations and that would be in Virginia. Uh, this has a denomination let me zoom out a little bit uh, a denomination of one shilling and three pence but you can also see in the bill right here pistarine uh, Denomination one shilling three pence underneath a pistarine, and this is the only bill uh, uh, that has pistarine on it. Every denomination of this issue uh, is denominated in amounts that are equally divisible by pistarines, and a pistarine is a two real coin that was minted in Spain, and has approximately twenty percent less silver than a two real coin minted in the New World, Mexico or Potosi, any of the Central or South American countries. And uh, those would be worth one shilling, six pence. And because it's 20% less, this is one shilling, three pence. So that's a pistarine bill. Uh, if you ever hear it referenced, that's what it is. So you can collect. Uh, different types of denominations. You can collect famous signers. Uh, for instance, here in New Jersey, uh, the central signature there is John Hart. He was a signer of the uh, Declaration of Independence for New Jersey. The bottom signature on this Pennsylvania bill is Francis Hopkinson. And he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Oh, 
Okay, the top signature here is Hendrik Fisher, and he was uh, part of the Stamp Act Congress uh, before uh, our revolution started, or that could really be the beginnings of it, uh, the discontent in the colonies. The top signature here is David Brearley, and he was uh, a New Jersey representative to the Constitution, and all of us have opinions one way or the other of how the uh, last presidential election came about, and uh, uh, we have David Brearley to thank, uh, along with the, a few other uh, people in the uh, Constitutional Convention, uh, who fought for equal representation of the smaller states, so that at the time, uh, Boston, New York, and Virginia didn't control the entire country. The smaller states, and especially the ones that didn't have real big seaports, would also get equal say in elections and, and the government. Uh, that particular note, or bill actually, was signed on the back by the United States government, Joseph Borden, who Bordentown, New Jersey was named after. His house was burnt by the British during the Revolutionary War. And one of my more recent acquisitions, uh, this bill, March 1776 from New York, that signature is James Jarvis. And he was responsible for uh, the Connecticut copper coinage. He was one of the uh, people involved in the company for coining coppers. He also got the federal contract for uh, striking the Fujio coppers, our very first federal copper coinage. But uh, every one of these signatures that you see on the bills, they're famous people at the time. Uh, the government didn't just uh, put a cool pen uh, in anybody's hand uh, that they pull out of a tavern to sign these. The people were respected citizens, businessmen in the com community, uh, people of renown. And in retirement, I hope to go through a lot of these names that have been forgotten to history, but only remembered because they're still on these bills. To my knowledge, all signatures on colonial paper money and continental currency were done by hand. None of them were applied in the printing process like is done today. Counterfeiting was a problem at the time, and there were uh, counterfeiting measures that could be taken. This is a $3 bill uh, from March 1776 from New Jersey. Uh, Black ink was rather common to get. Uh, the reverse or the back of this bill is printed in black, while the front of the bill has blue ink around the periphery with red ink in the middle, and uh, all of the printed lettering is in blue ink. And this is a very complicated process uh, requiring paper to go through the printing process a number of times. Uh, besides uh, the different color inks to discourage counterfeiting. There's also a watermark uh, on the back of the bill. It's a leaf print. Uh, this was one of Ben Franklin's uh, contributions to numismatics, taking a leaf from nature and turning it into a printing block. And every leaf has veins on it like a thumbprint, and no two leaves are the same. And that would discourage somebody uh, from trying to counterfeit. Not that they didn't try, but if you look at the attempts, they're nowhere near as detailed as the real thing is. Uh, there's a threat of death, which you can see here. As you're looking at it, uh, at the top is death to counterfeit, uh, which was generally an idle threat, but there were a few counterfeiters that were put to death. Uh, besides what we've discussed so far, there is mica in the paper. You can see a big mica flake right here, and that was added in the, the process of making the, the paper to uh, try to discourage uh, counterfeiting. And then complex engraving. All the outside edges, the border devices, uh, the more complex they are, the harder they are to counterfeit. So uh, that's one of the ways of uh, having an anti-counterfeiting measure. Another way, this is New Hampshire bill, it's called indenting. If you look on the left side of the bill, that may look like a sloppy cut to you, but that's intentional. 
Uh, these bills uh, were like in a big book. And when they were issued, they would slice them out of the book. And the remaining stub in the book would have this serial number on it, 4592. And when it came to redeem this, uh, uh, they would compare the bill to the stub. And if it matched, you got your money. And if it didn't match, you were out of luck. Uh, it was counterfeit. And one last anti-counterfeiting measure, easy for me to say, <laughs> is uh, they had uh, uh, blue counterfeit detectors. And these were uh, printed with the actual plates that were used for the real bills on printed on blue paper, generally blue paper, no signatures attached to them. But some big businesses or places that handled a lot of paper money had these and they could compare this to the actual bill, see if there's differences. And if there were, uh, they knew that somebody was trying to pass a counterfeit bill. And $30, uh, which this is, was a lot of money back in those days. Actually, it's a lot of money to me now, but it was worth a lot more. That, that was like more than a month's pay for or a laborer. Uh, so, you know, being stuck with a counterfeit bill could cost you a whole lot of money. But uh, that's the last I wanted to show on anti-counterfeiting measures. Continental currency. Uh, you saw the chart earlier, which I'm, I'm happy to uh, send a copy of that to anybody that uh, uh, wants it. But uh, just to go, there were several issues, and I'm not going to go into detail. There are a lot of different vignettes. Every denomination has a vignette, and that was carried through uh, on all the issues. So an $8 of uh, 1775 would have the same harp on it as uh, 1776 or 1778. And this particular bill was issued May 1775, $8 bill. This is a $6 bill a beaver eating a palm tree uh, for some reason. Do they have beavers in Florida? I don't know. Uh, but this is a $6 issue from November of 1775. Um, and we have May of 1776. You can see that harp design again. And July of 1776. Uh, there's a boar uh, and uh, somebody holding a spear to the right, and the boar is charging the spear. Actually, I believe that when they were hunting back in the day, uh, and they'd shoot the boar, if you didn't kill it, uh, that angry boar would turn around and attack you. So they'd have a spear and uh, run it into the boar if it attacked you. You don't want to be uh, attacked by an angry boar. November 1776, another $8 bill. Now, what was happening in November of 1776, the British Army was coming across New Jersey, and uh, the Army moved slower than word of mouth. And uh, uh, what happened was the Continental Congress in Philadelphia uh, got scared that the British were going to come across the river, and they moved to Baltimore. And you can see here, uh, this was... Uh, authorized in Baltimore, February 25th, 1777. But George Washington uh, that had that Christmas raid, the Battle of Trenton, turned the British around uh, the Battle of Tr uh, Trenton and uh, Battle of Princeton, and then went into a summer encampment. So in uh, May 1777, the Continental Congress comes back to Philadelphia again, which you can see here. But uh, this time, uh, the British did want to attack uh, uh, Philadelphia. So uh, they came, got Philadelphia, and the Continental Congress scurried over to Yorktown, uh, which is present day York, Pennsylvania. Actually, they were in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for a day. And they figured they'd be safer on the other side of the Susquehanna River. So they moved uh, the next day over to Yorktown. And they stayed there until the British evacuated Philadelphia. And then the next issue is uh, September 1778. And we have 
And uh, the last issue date is 1779, and I have a $5 bill there. Uh, all of these vignettes have symbols on them, uh, Latin phrases, uh, uh, and a lot of them Ben Franklin got out of a uh, book about vignettes from Europe. Uh, some of them were made up uh, by the people themselves. Here we have a, a multicolored note, uh, again, for anti-counterfeiting. Uh, this particular bill at the bottom left is signed by Thomas Edison. In Thomas Edison's authorized uh, biography, he mentions this patriot, but in contacting Edison uh, museums in the meantime, the curators there seem to think that uh, Edison included the patriot because it was cool to have one as your ancestor. But if this Thomas Edison was related in any way, it was a very, very distant relation. So I just went through a couple of continental currency bills there. Uh, of all the bills collected, continental currency seems to be uh, the most popular. Uh, then after that comes the states. But what I didn't do was February 1776. Uh, I wanted to show a few small bills here. Uh, these are the only fractional bills from the Continental Congress. This is a third of a dollar, a half a dollar, a sixth of a dollar, and two thirds of a dollar. You'll see the familiar design on the front there of a sundial and Fujio mind your business. And on the back side, the 13 rings, American Congress. So these designs are very similar to what's on the first federal copper in Fujio. And uh, they use, uh, there's an excellent article in the numismatist about 25 years ago by Eric Newman uh, showing how uh, ben Franklin came up with these designs. Uh, it's well worth uh, searching uh, uh, the ANA database of past issues to get a copy of that article. Wonderful read. Uh, and you might wonder why six, you can see a sense to maybe a half a dollar, but why two thirds of a dollar? Why one sixth of a dollar? And the reason being that these are not American dollars, these are Spanish mill dollars, which are eight reals. So if it's eight reals, why don't they have a, a half dollar, which is four reals, or a quarter dollar, which is two reals, or a one eighth of a dollar? The thing is that an eight real coin was worth uh, six shillings. So instead of dividing it in eighths of a dollar, they divided it into sixth of a dollar, which coincided with the value of a Spanish mill dollar in New England and Virginia, I believe. Uh, monies of account. Uh, every colony had their own money of account. Uh, right here, we have a bill from uh, Maryland that was torn in half, and to keep it in circulation, somebody put a pin in. These are called pin notes, and uh, this is a handmade pin. In that day, in those days, they didn't mass produce them. Uh, something that Eric Goldstein pointed out, and John Kralovich at uh, an ANA summer seminar is that the head of this pin, uh, if you look at it closely with the magnifying glass, you could see where they wrapped a thin piece of wire around and welded it in place. Uh, this is a cute little bill. Uh, this is a two shilling sixpence of uh, Connecticut. You can see in the center here, it was sewn back together. And, on the back, you can see that they glued it to a piece of paper, some type of document from 1769. They cut the edges down uh, to make it look cleaner. My wife's here telling me what to do. <laughs> uh, I want to take this out of the plastic. Uh, and then it's final. Assault was a slice cancel. Uh, when bills were turned in, they were canceled in a number of different ways. Connecticut, uh, for this series, used a large slice to cancel the note. Just as a reference, this Connecticut bill 
Man Fokus. This Connecticut bill was hole canceled. They punched a hole in it to take it out of circulation. And this one used to be the same size as that one before it was trimmed down to size. And uh, I think that the uh, canceled bills and the repaired bills, which are very economical to obtain, uh, have a lot of history behind them. And, and I find them kind of endearing. And I, I like affordable too. Uh, this one from Massachusetts was canceled on the bottom uh, with like a triangular cut. I don't have any canceled bills from New Jersey because what New Jersey did is after they took them in and, and they were redeemed, they burnt the bills. So collectors, unless you can find a pile of ashes that you can certify was a New Jersey bill originally, uh, you're out of luck for a canceled New Jersey bill. Uh, there are famous printers and engravers. Um, this is a five shilling bill from uh, Delaware. Uh, let's see, that has Boaz Manlov as uh, the bottom signature there. He was a loyalist and ended up fleeing the colonies. Uh, so at some point after 1776, you'll notice that on the date on the bottom, uh, it was printed 1770, but they left the last digit off, I guess, if they were going to use this in several different years. And the printer here at the bottom is James Adams. And James Adams was a, a former uh, Franklin employee. And you may never have even heard of his name uh, as a printer if it wasn't for colonial bills still being around. And we have a a 1756 bill from New Jersey. All those people who signed the bill are important people. But as far as printers go, on the back, you have uh, printed by James Parker. And James Parker was uh, the official printer to the king for the colony of New Jersey. And this is a 1776 February bill. And the top signature there, uh, let's see, six, uh, is Hendrick Fisher. And Hendrick Fisher was part of the Stamp Act Congress and uh, famous as such. Some of you may have seen this bill before. Uh, I'm going to take it out of the second plastic there. These are rare bills, but this is a sword and hand bill from Massachusetts. And you can see a colonist there uh, with the sword in one hand, he's holding a, a scroll that says Magna Carta in the other hand and issued in defense of American liberty. and. Uh, this was uh, printed from plates engraved by Paul Revere. Uh, Paul Revere made copper printing. There, there were a couple different methods of printing. Uh, you could print with blocks or print with copper plates. And uh, uh, Paul Revere, oh, let me get that zoom out of there. Yeah, Paul Revere uh, printed or engraved several different famous copper plates, uh, including this one, five shillings, that's a rising sun. And these are called the rising notes. And uh, that's also a, a product of a Paul Revere plate. And the last one uh, from Paul Revere is the codfish bill. And at the very top is a codfish above where it says Massachusetts State. And codfish was a big industry, uh, fishing here. And then I guess it was salted, stored in barrels and shipped back to England. Uh, but that was the, the last of the bills I had that were engraved, uh, printing plates engraved by Paul Revere. And we have a, a 10 shilling bill here. 
And this, let me get the right side up here. And move it in a little closer. And this was printed, if it comes in focus here. Here we come, printed by B. Franklin and D. Hall, uh, David Hall. And uh, although at this point in time, I doubt very much if Ben Franklin got any ink on his hands. And I'll show one more. Uh, this is the lowest denomination bill I have. Uh, this is one penny specie, one ninetieth of a dollar. Uh, Bank of North America, 1789, and on the back side, one penny specie, and you can see on the bottom, printed by B. F. Bosch, uh, Philadelphia, and uh, the B. F. stands for Benjamin Franklin, and this happens to be printed by Ben Franklin's grandson. There's only one colonial bill that actually portrays a revolutionary battle. And that's South Carolina, uh, the 1778 bill of 10 shillings. Uh, a couple days before our Declaration of Independence around uh, the be very beginning of July, 1776, the British tried to take uh, the harbor of Charleston. And we fought them off. They had, they had to flee and they had to burn one of their ships to prevent the rebels from getting it. But if you look at the vignette, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this, see what kind of detail we can get. Okay, on the left, you can see Fort Sullivan, which was later named Fort Moultrie, with a flag and a half moon on it. And on the right, you can see the British ships and you can see the smoke as the ships are firing Fort Moultrie and Fort Moultrie is firing back. And uh, it was a great victory for the colonists and they prevented Charleston from being captured for what, another four years approximately, something like that. But that's the only bill, it's called the Palmetto Bill, but it's the only bill uh, in the colonial period that portrays an actual revolutionary war battle. I hope you guys are having fun, I am. Uh, I never saw the sense to amassing a, a big collection of coins or paper money, and you keep it in a safe deposit box, never to enjoy, and uh, not sharing it with anybody. And then when you die, your wife sells it for half of what it's worth. But uh, this is a bill of 15 Spanish mold dollars in Virginia. And the vignette over here, has the uh, the symbol of a, a classical victory standing on top of King George the Third. His crown fell on the ground uh, along with uh, regal uh, material, and a bag broke open with money on the ground. And we've heard this phrase before: "Sic semper tyrannis." That's always to tyrants, and uh, uh, we know that from when uh, Abe Lincoln was. Uh, uh, martyred in uh, Virginia in the movie theater. But I think that that was an, a very brave thing to say uh, with respect to this vignette in the 1770s when the war was not going all that good. This is actually 1777. You can see very faintly where the seven was written in there. The war was not going that good. And this is kind of like uh, poking the king in the nose <laughs> at, at a bad time. And I just wanted to show this, the highest denomination bill that was printed in the colonies was $2,000, and this was done in Virginia. Man, that's a lot of money. Uh, but uh, it sounds like a lot, but if, if you read the text, uh, you would get one Spanish mill dollar for 40 at the rate 
And uh, so it wasn't as big as it sounds, but it was still pretty big. And just recently, uh, I came up, those that know me uh, know that uh, my church community is important to me. So I collected a few colonial bills that have religious themes. Uh, this 40 shilling bill of uh, uh, 1754 from uh, North Carolina uh, has a vignette of a church. And this is actually what Christ Church looked like in New Bern, North Carolina in the 1750s. Also from North Carolina, Move it over. 1754 again. You can see in the vignette they had the Bible. And uh, now I, I hear almost every year people try to get in God and trust taken off of our coins and paper money. And man, I wonder how they'd react if they saw something like this on the money nowadays. Uh, this is a New York bill, 1775. And on the back are the Ten Commandments with the sword in front of them. Let me focus. And I plan to do a little article about this in the C4 newsletter. There's a reason for the sword being there, and uh, but it's obvious that these are the Ten Commandments, and uh, uh, you know, the pretty bold statement at the time. Uh, of what was happening in New York. That was 1775, before the British occupation. And the last bill is a piece of continental currency where our Continental Congress authorized a $60 bill. And that a little smaller. And it has a globe of the world. And in Latin, uh, it says uh, from Psalm 97, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. And I thought that that was pretty cool. I want to show those to my pastors at church one of these days soon. And that was just a, a recent uh, uh, thing I had uh, tried. There's so many ways to have fun. Being that I'm from New Jersey, uh, I, of course, I have more the, from that state than any others. Um, here are two bills. Uh, these are from February 1776. Again, you see John Hart, uh, his signature in the middle. Samuel Tucker uh, was a treasurer for West Jersey, and uh, Samuel Howe signed up on top. Uh, when the British came over into New Jersey in uh, December of 1776, uh, the state treasury had to be hidden. So Samuel Tucker uh, got together in a tavern in Trenton with John Abbott. Uh, all this is local to me where I live. And John Abbott agreed to hide the state treasury and papers on his farm. Uh, what happened was is one of the barmaids overheard the conversation and she was a loyalist. And when the British came to town, she squealed on him. So uh, on December 9th, uh, 1776, Lieutenant Colonel Abercrombie uh, ordered an officer and 20 troops to hike the five miles uh, to the Abbott farm and uh, check it out. When they got there, they did discover half of the treasury. What they found was the treasury that didn't yet have uh, Samuel Tucker's signature on it. And, uh, and they confiscated this. So this particular bill was in the hands of the British army uh, at some point in time. Uh, I would think that, uh, Having been in the army myself, I would imagine British soldiers would have had a lot of fun with these bills uh, in the pubs that evening. If it got, but I probably the officer turned it in and it went through regular channels. But this is called a raid note uh, because the British uh, captured it. The British did not find any of the bills that had three signatures on them, making them legal tender. Okay, I have two bills here that are uncirculated, uh, both the same issue of December 1763. I have a 15 shilling bill 
and a 12 shilling bill. And the reason I had these two is that, especially when I'm giving presentations uh, to young people, I like to let them know that adults make mistakes too. On the left, you can see that this was printed by James Parker in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And on the right, it was printed by James Parker in Woodbridge, New Jersey. He misspelled the town, put in too many zeros. Some people asked if this was done intentionally as an anti-counterfeiting measure. And I don't think so. If they were gonna use an anti-counterfeiting measure, they'd hide something in the border or in the leaf or someplace else. They wouldn't do something so obvious as to mis, uh, misspell the town. But I wanted to show that. And the last of the New Jersey bills I wanted to show is a six pound bill. You'll notice it looks very similar uh, to the three pound bill that I showed earlier. Uh, this is called a Rittenhouse bill. And the reason being is on the border. I'm gonna see how much I can magnify this. a little less okay in the border of what looks like a basket here are the letters uh the name written house and uh we uh, equate this with our our first mint director uh, david rittenhouse uh i don't know that there's ever been any actual proof that he is the written house but the rest of the Rittenhouse family in Philadelphia were involved in paper making for the most part. And he was uh, probably the only one with the artistic and manual uh, skills uh, to make border elements like this. So we're believing that this was uh, uh, our David Rittenhouse that uh, had made this, uh, the border elements for this and most likely for the three pound issue also. Okay, there's been uh, information recently in uh, the numismatist and elsewhere about the continental dollar. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen a real one. Uh, let me focus in here. But if you've never seen a real one, you're not going to see one today either. <laughs> this is uh, a gallery mint reproduction of the continental dollar. And in recent times, uh, uh, articles written by uh, Bill Eckberg, uh, 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 Eric Goldstein, and uh, uh, David, uh, oh, his last name uh, slips my mind at the moment but research has been done and uh, there's been no documentation that the Continental Congress ever actually had something to do with this. And there's controversies that go back a little bit back and forth about it. I'm, in, uh, I'm personally am of the belief that uh, the real continental currency uh, coin was probably a token made in Europe uh, for sale over there and possibly for sale here. But uh, if you really want a uh, continental dollar that there's no dispute about whatsoever. This is the very first continental dollar authorized by the Continental Congress, uh, May of 1775. And it looks as though it has a pot on a fire, but uh, what that is actually, it's a weight and it's on top of a plant. And the Latin, if it's translated, says though crushed it recovers and uh, you know it's uh, all of these vignettes have something of significance for our revolution and our time period but this is the very first uh, continental dollar authorized by the continental congress there were actually five of them uh, you have may 1775 november 1775 February 1776, 
if you like the magic date, which I do, May of 1776, and the last one issued was uh, a multicolor, and that was uh, January 1779. So those, those are the continental dollars. doing time-wise okay well we're we're closing in i figure out i'll show you one sheet in case you had questions about how these were printed uh sheets were printed and there were a number of bills anywhere from two uh to i think 24 on a sheet uh depending on uh what it was the fractional continental currency a friend of mine has and uh and i think that those had 24 on a sheet oh, I, I need to ask him about that but here you have a sheet of three bills two shillings and six pence one pound and ten shillings and there were i think eight different denominations printed in this issue I, i'm not positive about that uh, but I'm guessing there were about eight. So there were a couple other sheets. I, I do have another sheet with other denominations on it. But keep in mind that sometimes these sheets aren't that expensive. Uh, you could, I, I've seen these sheets sold to people for like five or six hundred dollars, and they cut the bills out uh, because technically they're uncirculated. And if you sold the three bills separately, uh, you might realize more money than if you sold the sheet intact. And I'm dead set against that because you're you're destroying history. Uh, this sheet came down intact, and it's my opinion it should stay intact. Uh, okay, I think at this point in time, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Sam. And let's see. All right, Ray. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, we uh, definitely did have some questions, and uh, earlier I think you were referring to uh, Dave McCarthy, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, okay. exactly. Right. The older right. I get, the worse my memory gets, and, uh, and all this was done without cue cards. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but, someone chimed in, but I did know it was McCarthy you were probably uh, referring okay, to. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, so real quick, uh, I'm going to be launching a survey for everyone to fill out. Uh, let me do that right now, and then we will... Uh, get to our questions. But folks, before you uh, leave the presentation, please complete this survey. Uh, it's multiple choice, uh, so I hope you choose to take it. Um, but um, if you need to elaborate on one of uh, your answers or have additional comments, please email them to Brianna Victor at seminars at money.org. So with, uh, we'll let people uh, begin uh, doing that poll. But uh, we did have about a uh, so far, about five or six questions came in, Ray. So uh, okay, good. The first I'll do my one, best to answer them. If, if I don't have an answer, I'll make one up. Nice. That's usually what I like to do. <laughs> but that worked when I used to teach middle school. But, um, oh. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, first question uh, says, do you have some favorite deals that you like to work with? I'm not some sure, uh, favorite dealers? Well, it said deals, not dealers. So that's why I thought that was a little strange. We can uh, Maybe come back to that one if uh, they can. Uh, well, I, I think they're probably saying dealers. That'd be my guess. Yeah, and I do, I do, but uh, I don't think that this is a place. I I don't want to advertise. Uh, this is a non-commercial function here. Yeah, and, oh, uh, oh, yes. uh, there there are dealers I like, and uh, so it's uh, if you see me at a convention or something, I can stir you to a table. Nice. All right. Uh, oh, we have a question from a YN who wants to know roughly how many of each type of note were printed. Okay. Well, you could know pretty precisely how many were authorized if you get uh, Eric Newman's book on early paper money of America, because uh, it lists in that book each denomination and how many were authorized. Now, if they actually printed the full amount, that's another story. But I would imagine that they probably printed the full amount most of the time. But Eric Newman's book uh, should have the answer. 
Okay, speaking of <laughs> printers, uh, was Crane uh, making paper for printers back then? I guess they're referring to Crane and Company. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the Crane people started later uh, into the 1800s. I, I, I can't say for certain. I'm not aware that they did. I haven't done a lot of study about print. I, I find it unusual that the Rittenhouse family, there's a town right outside of Philadelphia called Rittenhouse Town. And, uh, and that's where the Rittenhouse family had a mill to make paper. And that was a lot closer to Philadelphia than Ivy Mills was. But Ivy Mills seemed to be producing most of the paper for the Continental Congress and uh, for the Pennsylvania issues. So uh, that's an area that I wanna do a little more research in, but uh, I'm sure if you Google Crane, uh, you can find out when their starting date was for uh, paper production. All right. Uh, another uh, person asks, were the colonial bills only honored in the colony of issue? Uh, when canceled, were new replacement bills issued? And were the colonial bills convertible into specie or coins or tokens of the era? Wow, that's uh, three questions. Uh, Okay, I may have to ask you to repeat a question. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so the first, I didn't realize, I thought it was just one long question. Didn't realize. Okay. It was. Okay, which so was the first, first one? one? Uh, were the colonial bills only honored in the colony of issue? Mm, not necessarily. Uh, take for instance, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey was pretty much uh, divided into East and West Jersey, and East Jersey followed the economics and the commerce of New York. West Jersey followed the economics and the commerce of Philadelphia, and bills would circulate across the borders, but the further you got away from the state issuing, uh, the less likely it would be that your paper money would be accepted. But if commerce was being done back and forth all the time between uh, businesses uh, going across the Delaware River, or across the Hudson River, uh, the notes would be accepted and then paid back on the next, uh, uh, commercial transaction. Uh, what was the second question? Um, second question was, uh, when canceled, were new replacement bills issued? Yeah, new bills were issued by legislation. Some of that legislation was to replace bills that were canceled. Okay, hopefully I can make it through all the questions. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, legislation authorized the printing of more bills to either replace canceled bills uh, that were turned in or to uh, 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 be used in the economy for the purposes of the state. You know, building structures, buildings, uh, things like that. And then somebody might ask, what backed the paper money? Uh, rarely was it hard currency, but, uh, you know, land speculation, they hoped to get funds uh, uh, by the sale of land. And after the Revolutionary War, by the sale of the Tory property, loyalist property that were confiscated uh, by the American uh, rebels, uh, but, and also by taxation. If you were fortunate to be in a state that had an active port, uh, they had import and export duties, uh, which could back the bills. Okay. So um, one person asks, uh, was colonial currency redeemable at face value? Uh, not really. It, it got to a point, uh, well, it depends, uh, colonial currency. A lot of the state issues were early on, uh, and so was uh, the Continental Congress issues. But as time went on with uh, the Continental currency, uh, you know, by the 1790s, uh, they were being redeemed $1 and 100. So if you were paid $100 for horses that... Uh, uh, the Revolutionary Army needed off your farm. Uh, when you could redeem that, you might only get one dollar. So you sold all your horses for a dollar. So uh, was a uh, colonial currency backed by uh, hard assets like gold or silver? Uh, sometimes there were some, uh, but in general, not. Uh, you, you could redeem it if they had the hard currency to redeem, and they tried to get the hard currency by taxes or selling land. There's a lot of land speculation uh, going on at the time. But the, there were public buildings, lighthouses, uh, workhouses, prisons that needed to be built, toll roads, 
So there were tolls and uh, taxes uh, that were needed in order to uh, back these bills. Uh, let's see, one person asks, is there a reference that lists all possible signers of the issue to help us figure out the signatures when the ink is very faded? Ah, uh, okay, uh, good question. Well, Eric Newman's book does list uh, the known signatures. Uh, it's not always correct. Uh, I know that there's one instance in the February 1776 New Jersey uh, where uh, the listed signers are not correct, but if you go to the updated living uh, early paper Money of America on the portal, uh, that is corrected and updated. But for the most part, uh, what's listed as far as signatures are correct. And I know with continental currency, all the signers are listed in alphabetical order in early paper Money of America. Uh, if somebody collects continental currency, and would like a list of the signers that are by issue, they can email me and I can send them a list. Uh, so instead of having to look through uh, 300, 400 names to try to find out who that faint signature is, you'd only have to look through you know, 20, 30, 50 of that particular issue to try to find the name you're looking at. Hmm. Nice. All right. Oh, here's an interesting one. How do you preserve your notes? Okay, well, I keep them in plastic sleeves, non-PVC. Uh, I, uh, I have a lot of them that I purchased in slabs, uh, both uh, PCGS and PMG. Uh, and if I purchase them that way, I leave them that way because they're protected. Uh, but, uh, you know, just non-PVC sleeves that you can get from your numismatic supplier. As far as storing them goes, they can take up some room. I looked at some books, uh, albums to put them in, but they take up a lot of space and just keeping them uh, in their sleeves, it fits a lot better in a safe deposit box. Sure. Okay. Uh, interesting question here. When did it change from United Colonies to United States? I know that it changed. I'm not sure. I'd, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd have to look at the bills. But if you looked at early paper money of America, uh, uh, it, it probably shows the bills in there. And I think it was after a couple issues. So maybe in uh, 1776. I know it started off as United Colonies. But I, I don't know the answer offhand. If you email me, I will definitely find the answer and reply to you. Nice. And uh, we had that email up on the screen. I don't know if you want to uh, share that uh, one more time, that one uh, screen with your email address, right? Sure. Um, I should uh, still uh, have uh, co-host and duties here. Okay. Yeah. Classic, easy to remember, a and email address with first initial and last name at money.org. Yep, that's it. I really hope some people email me with questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they may. <laughs> That'll keep me oh, busy yeah. the rest of the week. But I there love sharing this. I, I wish I could see faces out there. Um, I know. No, and, there were, and you had about 54 of them out there, too, at one point, or 53, <laughs> rather. But, um, Good. So, Ray, let's see. Oh, um, Okay, another uh, question just came sure. in. Uh, where are the best places, venues, or options to buy continental uh, currency? Oh, okay. Uh, well, the major auction houses, uh, myself personally, I, I've purchased uh, continental currency and state bills from Stax Bowers in New York and uh, Heritage in uh, Texas. Uh, there are smaller auctions that are around, and if you can find those, uh, you might be able to have a, a shot at getting something uh, at more of a bargain if it's uh, not a widely publicized auction. The major shows, I know I go to Baltimore uh, to the Whitman Expo, and I normally have luck there with some dealers. Uh, I'm on a budget, so you know I, I'm 
Uh, I have a lot of friends that collect that are millionaires. I'm not one of them. <laughs> so I, I have uh, a lot of fun collecting uh, at a level where I can maintain a happy marriage. Right, honey? <laughs> She's not in your happy medium for all of us. <laughs> a, a major show is the A and A annual A and A convention has a, a lot of paper money dealers. There is a paper money show uh, out west. Uh, I've never been to it, uh, but uh, I, I hope to maybe next year uh, see what it's all about. Nice. So uh, Ray, uh, one last question. I'm not sure if you did answer this or not. Um, were uh, the bills exchangeable for U.S. currency at the end of the Revolutionary War? Well, by U.S. currency... Yeah, um, it could be paper. <laughs> yeah, well, the U.S. currency at the end of the Revolutionary War was continental currency. I don't think that yeah. the United States had uh, its own money until the 1800s. Right. Uh, such. Uh, yeah. But I would That's imagine... I figured I'd ask the question. Yeah, I, I would assume that there were some transactions where a state bill was issued and sh you might have gotten some continental currency in change. Uh, I, uh, I can't say that there were money changers that would change New Jersey bills for continental currency. I, I don't know if uh, those existed or not. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, one other question just came in. Uh, it said, could you please discuss how the leaf prints were made? That is, how was the leaf pattern transferred to the printing plate? Ah. <laughs> okay, the library company of Philadelphia uh, has in their possession three printing blocks that made Delaware bills from uh, 1759 and 1760. And uh, so you can actually see the printing block, what it looks like. And uh, uh, the actual metal part is maybe three eighths of an inch thick. Uh, and then underneath it is a wooden block. Uh, it had to have been from a mold of some kind. Uh, we don't know exactly what they did, but it was a process that evidently Ben Franklin only taught some of his associates to do. And those associates carried it on uh, for other states uh, once Ben Franklin actually retired from getting his hands dirty. So we're assuming that they took an actual leaf uh, or leaves, sometimes there were more than one, pressed it into something that was like a plaster mold, I'm assuming, and then they would pour in molten lead. Now, you think about lead being very soft and that it would wear out pretty quickly in the printing process. This was a lead alloy. They had other elements, other metals in there, I think some tin and some other things uh, so that it was easy to melt, but it was pretty hard. So they'd get a lot of print, thousands and thousands of printings out of it, uh, maybe more than 10,000 uh, before they'd wear out. Uh, die. So three of these printing blocks, uh, blocks do exist, and we assume that they were made from molds from uh, uh, actual, well, we know that they were made from actual leaves. Nice. All right. Well, yeah, I think uh, that is all the questions. Let me just double check. I think we have a, uh, yeah, I think that is, uh, that is everything for the questions there. So again, uh, Ray, I definitely want to thank you. And again, for those of you that are still on, please complete our survey before you leave the presentation. Um, Again, if you need to elaborate on one of your answers or have additional comments, please email them uh, to the ANA here. Uh, Brianna Victor will receive them if you send them to seminars at money.org. Again, that's seminars at money.org if you have anything else to add about the presentation. Um, again, I want to thank Ray Williams uh, for your time today. Uh, we have a certificate of appreciation that we will be sending to you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Uh, please join us for our next presentation, Siege Stories, Tales of Courage and Defiance by Dr. Lawrence C. Korknack. This will be taking place tomorrow at the same time or noon, Mountain Daylight Time. Really hope you all can join us. Um, we'll see you. Uh, if uh, you need to uh, register for the next presentation and haven't done so already, 
you can uh, please visit info.money.org slash e-learning to do so. Or it may just be easier. Go to the ANA website, money.org, and uh, the big slider across the uh, homepage there. Just click on that. Um, thanks again for joining us, everyone. We will see you next time at the ANA's e-learning academy. Thanks again, Ray. Thanks again. Great job, sir. Thank you. Talk to Thank you again you. soon. Thank you. Take care, everyone.